Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding, sitting here on the number one value investing podcast in the world, soon to be the number one value investing YouTube channel in the world as well, on our way to being just the number one value investing content creators in the world with my co-founder, Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? Uh, it's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great for everybody else. Hey, if it's the first time you're tuning in, hit that subscribe button, thumbs this video up, bring you guys a ton of different videos. And then of course, if you're listening on the podcast side of things, a rating review goes a very long way. If you like quickfs.net, which is the website that Jeff and I use every single day to pull financials, uh, you could either click the link in the show notes or when you sign up, um, you could tell them that you came from us and we'll get a piece of that subscription price. So in today's video, we are going to be doing a Q&A. It is Monday, and this is something that we do plan to do every single Monday. So the best place to ask questions is on my Twitter, at Focus Compound, or you can email info at focuscompound.com. But you know, because I always pull this tweet up when I do a call for questions, the best place really is Twitter, at Focus Compound. So let's jump into it. We have, I think, 35 questions. Uh, so let's start to roll it out. Uh, first one asks for a snap judgment on EML. Let's pull it up on QuickFS. The Eastern Company. Uh, I don't have a snap judgment on this one. I think I'll be writing it up in the next week for the website. Oh, okay. So no snap judgment. Uh, it, I will mention one thing about it. So I've mentioned before, like uh, gram number, or whatever you want to call it, like having a fairly low PE and uh, price to book combined, where you multiply the two together. Graham suggested that uh, you shouldn't have something where the product of the PE and the price to book are more than 22 and a half. If you notice here, you can look there at the PE and the PB, and they're quite low. And so that's one of the, it showed up on a screen. So you're saying that one. if you you add both of those together? Multiply. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And that's actually been, I found that to be true for obscure stocks. Now for big stocks, I don't know so much, but for obscure stocks, that actually proves to be a very effective way, often much better than either the price to earnings or the price to book that people look at. Most things that people talk to me about either have a very low price to earnings, but have a high price to book, or they have a high price to book, but they have a low price to earnings or whatever, but they don't tend to be both. If you have both and you also have a history of, you know, pretty good earnings, uh, you know, or uh, profits, you know, not losses in the past or whatever, um, it, it works out pretty well. Graham also had another test that was a certain amount of, uh, certain limit on debt. So that, that also is why. And, um, and that, this is a Ben Graham type of company. So. Got it. So do you like the company, though? Uh, wait for my write-up. All right. Wait like for your write-up. Well, Brian Green is a member of Focus Convo, so he'll <laughs> get his answer. Uh, <laughs> thoughts on Tandy. We talked a little bit about Tandy. This, is, this video is going up today, Monday. And we mm -hmm. did go over Tandy a little bit in the uh, podcast later on this week, but we didn't really go too in-depth. But do you have any general thoughts on TLF? Uh, I'm very bad with retailers. I'd say in general, it's not an area where uh, I'm very strong. They haven't, um, as of now, I don't I don't know if there's been news or something, they haven't filed an updated um, SEC stuff. They're in Fort Worth, um, so not far from us. And I assume they'd be communicative once they are current in their financials. Um, so I would wait for their financials to come out and stuff. I think I've said before, there's evidence in their, uh, results and stuff that it could be something that could be turned around, but it's just been so long since we've updated financials. I was, um, reading the earnings call transcripts and stuff of the CEO who came in and stuff. It's a turnaround. It, it for a turnaround, it looks good, but turnarounds are tough and retail's tough. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, someone said the CFO was just replaced last week. The guy seems to be getting paid a ton in my opinion. He is from a staffing temp CFO business, I think. So hopefully he'll be gone soon. Uh, I, he probably deserves to be paid a ton considering what their <laughs> having to deal with. Is. I don't think a lot of people would want to take that CFO job right now. Touche. Um, how do you see the idea of taking a mortgage and using the proceeds to invest in stocks with pricing power or revenue from real assets like timber slash real estate, et cetera, especially in an environment of mild to high inflation? So uh, mortgaging your house to purchase stocks. Yeah. Well, I, I would be in favor of that. Um, <laughs> we got to add a disclaimer uh, to this video. <laughs> um, well, no, I'd be in favor of that because I'm. It, the more equity that you, the more of your money you tie up in land in, in a house, uh, over time, the less money you're going to have at the end of your life. Um, so whether you want to do that by not owning a home or you want to do that by borrowing or, or whatever the situation is, but paying for a, a home outright is not a very effective use of your money generally. Mm -hmm. um, not generally. It's pretty lousy use of your money. Um, now, in terms of real assets and stuff, I don't know uh, enough about them. But, yeah, timberland or stuff like that. Obviously, real estate, if you invest in, like, um, 
some for, some form of uh, income producing real estate or something that generally has much better returns than a house. Yeah. Um, but you have to do it in a smart way. Yeah. But Timberland bought at a reasonable price and stuff that, that makes a lot more sense than owning a home. Sure. Uh, stamp I mean, judgment. Yeah. Then using a bank to own your home, I should say that makes sense. <laughs> snap judgment on F L X S. Okay. Flex steel industries. Flex Steel Industries, together with its subsidiaries, manufacturers, imports, and markets, residential and contract upholstered and wood furniture products. So, furniture company. Um, let's see. Revenue in 2010 was 326 million, and in 2019 it was 444 million. PE, you know, I don't know if this is correct. It's negative PE, EV to free cash flow, negative. We could look at the EV to sales, which is 0.1, and then the EBIT is 5.6. So generally speaking, that's kind of in our wheelhouse. We always say take the EV to sales, move the decimal point one. Well, actually, mm -hmm. yeah, so it's right there. 10-year um, uh, CAGR, 3.2% on revenue. Um, there's not a lot here on... Seventy million dollar market cap. There's really not a lot here on. Uh, quick yeah, FS, can but we look at the balance sheet? Sure. Um, so it looks very cheap on a price to sales basis, but obviously something happened in the very recent past that would be a concern. Also, it's a furniture company and stuff. I don't know things about like um, if they got payments from the government and stuff in the last ten years. Um, the balance sheet. Let's see. So what's their cash situation? Uh, looks like they have twenty two million in cash. Receivables. 38 million. And then inventory? 94 million. And then what's their total liability situation? Total liabilities, 49 million. Okay. Um, that looks pretty interesting. I mean, you have a strong current asset position, which is important. You have a history of earnings in the past. No debt. Yeah, you have a history of earnings in the past. Um, you would need to make sure that the business isn't com going to like keep putting money in something that's completely falling apart or something. And you have to remember there's a difference here between like if we control this company or something and whatever they're planning to do, and maybe what they're planning to do is not what you as an investor want them to do if they're in an industry you don't like. Um, but it looks really interesting, yeah, as a value stock. Let's look at the cash flow statement. Yeah. Oh, that looks very interesting. Can you give me the last uh, two? What let's... looks very interesting? So give me the last, what was their trailing 12 months cash flow from operations? Negative three million. Okay, and when have they in the past had a cash flow from operations that are negative other than that? Never. Okay, and the year before, the last full year, we I don't know when their fiscal year ends, but let's assume that the transfer of months isn't a full year, um, was positive, correct? Mm -hmm. So from, let's say, 2016, it was 54 million, 2017, 26 million, 2018, 27 million, and then 2019 was right. 7 million. I don't know what the other is. But if you look, you'll notice that even though we saw a huge net income negative number, they actually produced some cash flow from operations in that year. Um, so it's interesting. You could take cumulatively, one of the things I would do probably is to add up all 10 years of cash flow from operations, then subtract out all the additions to property, plant, and equipment, and see if that number is positive, and if so, how positive. And if that's a big number versus the, the enterprise value and stuff today, that can sometimes be very interesting. But of course, you want to make sure that they haven't completely deteriorated in, say, 2020 versus 2010 as like an industry or something like that. Like it, it can't be something that gets better. It looks like they raised debt in 2015 and then paid it off right away in 2016. Yeah. So I, it looks interesting, but I, I really don't know enough without knowing the particulars um, of it. But the balance sheet looks interesting and the price to sales looks interesting. Those are the two things that stand out. Cool. Well, maybe you'll take a look at it. Um, let's see. Jeff said recently that if there are low expected returns, that usually is right before there are higher expected returns because of a crash. What if we don't have a crash because central bank's intervention, central bank intervention, isn't it equally possible that we would have a flat market for a period of years? Yes, and in my experience, I've always predicted the flat market and we always get the crash. <laughs> so <laughs> I always look at it from the perspective of, well, we won't go anywhere for the next seven years. And instead, in about seven months, we get a drop that that is equivalent to losing seven years of earnings or something. So I don't know. Um, but that's been my experience. That was my, and, to, and now this is just going back to 2000 and, you know, and, and it's not all things, but like in, in 2000 and NASDAQ and stuff, there was a pretty serious crash in, in just a few years. And then there's a pretty serious crash again around 2008 or so. It's also been true when I've seen things that and like commodity stuff that doesn't make any sense. The two that stand out in the last 10 years or so, uh, yeah, um, 10 plus years, is um, oil and cotton. Both of them got to prices that seemed insane. And uh, they could, you know, I mean, it could, 
they didn't have to drop quite as fast as they did, but they dropped pretty fast. So yeah, that's just been my uh, experience. Uh, I don't know. That is something that I think about in terms of the interest rate stuff. Um, it is worth mentioning though that, that, as they said, which is correct, what would happen is that with interest rates, um, if you have low interest rates, that helps you keep stock prices at the same level. It doesn't actually let you have stock prices that keep increasing at the kind of levels you had before because you'd have to have constantly decreasing interest rates would be pretty difficult to do. Um, so because of that, uh, yeah, it, it, but you know, it can go on for a little while. It, it went on in the late 1990s in the U S for a couple years where it was very expensive and it kept going and it happened in Japan for at least a couple of years. People were short Japan and stuff, value investors, and they had to keep doing it for several years. I was re just reading the Peter Kundal book and, um, he talks a little bit about how he like was really thinking about taking off a short position in Japan just before it did finally crash. And that got to, in some ways, I think Japan was crazier than anything that happened in the U.S. in 2000. So, hmm. This uh, guy, he's actually giving me a lot of advice on YouTube. So shout oh. out to him. Very nice. Um, somebody actually said piggybacking on this. I'm in the camp that there will be a crash. Aren't numbers pointing to the fact that we will see a slump in equity returns over the next decade? Finally, what assets and or industries are you looking at for returns over a 10-year horizon? Um, so that's a good question. One thing is that... The, all these things are happening very fast. To some extent, banks are somewhat more attractive than when we talked about them before. I may have um, overstated the harm done to them by interest rate stuff. This has to do with the steepness of the curve and stuff like that. And it depends on the bank. But in some cases, banks may not be harmed as much as I uh, kind of made it sound earlier on. And their stock prices have come down, some of them a lot. So banks are one. How do you draw that conclusion? Why do you think that? Um, just because of what has happened with the yield curve. Um, which is that it hasn't been as low on the longer end of some things and for some things that have to do with um, uh, credits to companies and things like that. So like, for instance, long-term corporate bonds and stuff aren't necessarily that low versus other things. Uh, like, so we often say interest rates are the lowest they've ever been or something like that. Eh, Interest rates for the federal government are the lowest they've ever been, basically. But to give you an idea, in like 19, right after the war, uh, World War II, um, municipal bonds for perfectly good municipalities and stuff were about 1%. Um, some corporate bonds were very cheap in the, in the 1940s and stuff. And anyway, so they're not necessarily, that part of things hasn't necessarily gotten as bad as I might have worried that it would have. Um, and, and it, depends on the bank, but it, it can be kind of helpful for a bank if it's easy to borrow short-term amounts and stuff. Those aren't usually the banks that like that much, though. But um, yeah, so banks are somewhat more attractive than maybe we talked about initially. Um, it, it's hard to say uh, with um, different industries there. That's what the question is specifically. Mm -hmm. Industries, yeah. I, I think banks could be interesting and stuff. One problem that you have is um, it's kind of we talk about range of possibilities and stuff. The range of possibilities has kind of gotten a little more complex in terms of you within 10 years, you both have some, some risk of deflation. I wouldn't get too concerned about that. The big risk from deflation for most companies is just that it tends to happen at the same time you have a recession or depression or something. And, um, the bigger one is that there's significantly more risk of meaningful inflation now than there was before. Mm -hmm. So that's increased a lot. That doesn't mean that I'm predicting inflation or something. I'm just saying that, uh, if you look at sort of the tail or whatever, there's a high numbers of inflation within 10 years are a lot more meaningful. And that also means things like higher interest rates and stuff like that. So things that can accommodate that, usually those are pretty liquid uh, things like banks and, and financial stuff, or they're things with good brands and stuff. It'd be hard like if you're a manufacturer. Got it. Uh, thoughts on FRD? You can oh. pull it up, quick FS. Yeah. Tell them that you came from us if you sign up. I, I, yeah, I think it's free ministries, right? Yep. Freeman Industry Incorporated. So, so I don't know the, I, I mean, we see the price, but I'm trying to remember the exact price at which this happens. But uh, Freeman Industries is a net net, um, I believe, but the company doesn't confirm this and stuff. So I, I haven't found this out f uh, through a totally verifiable source or whatever, that it's um, dependent on Nucor and U.S. Steel. 
um, that basically it's getting a product from them, sort of like vitreous glass, mm. uh, where they were had a thing where they would get a product from one company and then they also had customer concentration. So I, I don't know necessarily about how much customer concentration there is. There certainly is a lot. I think there is some because I think that sometimes buy stuff, then do things to it and then sell it back and stuff. But um, I think that their supply that they're using is dependent on mills that are near them. Um, so it's a steel business, but it's a little different than some steel companies. It is a net net, and it it sort of checks all the boxes of a kind of net net that Graham would invest in. So uh, if we can just look at the current assets and stuff. So what are total liabilities? Let's start with that. Total liabilities are thirteen million, or I'm sorry, fourteen million. Okay, and then if we look at current assets, what's cash? Cash is twelve million. So pretty close uh, cash to all their liabilities, and then on top of that, you have receivables mm -hmm. and you have inventory. And remember, the inventory is steel that someone sold them or is likely to buy from them pretty quickly. Also, if we look, it's a very quick asset because if we look at the um, history, I guess is a good way of doing it. Look at how much the inventory has uh, changed over time and stuff. So it hasn't just gone up the entire time. It has significantly, but compared to some companies, you see much more uh, variation in that. So, so what do you mean by that? So let's, uh, so there isn't, I would say we can also look at the summary to see this. I think they have a pretty good way of turning it into cash. Um, some companies worry me. We talked a little bit about Tandy and their growth phase or something. It, it's weird. Uh, net nets, I wouldn't necessarily be excited by them growing a lot. In fact, and this is true with heavily indebted companies too. If I have concerns about a company's financial position, decreasing over time its um, balance sheet and stuff isn't the thing that worries me. What actually worries me is bad quality growth. And so here, if you have a much more cyclical sort of thing where it turns it into cash over time and then and then back into assets, um, that sometimes is better for me, for a net net. If it, see, if we look at the summary, let's look at the summary so I can show you the, um, yeah. So the return on invested capital is sometimes poor. It's sometimes okay. It um, I've looked at it over the entire period. It's actually average for a, um, it, on a tangible basis. It's average over the last 20 years or so. But you can see that a meaningfully bad part of it is in just in the last few years. Mm -hmm. So we're counting that. If you take the entire 20 years or so, it's, it's pretty typical of um, on a tangible basis, like just a normal company. So it would seem that it deserves a price to book of, you know, close to one, certainly net current asset value of one, uh, you know, price to net current asset value. But there is this problem that the most recent, the bad period is in the most recent period. Um, uh, there's some evidence that I've tried to find and stuff about it that it may have kind of old and I don't want to say outdated plants and stuff because they put more money into them, but it, it doesn't sound like they're an incredibly valuable um, property plant and equipment, you know, and they are dependent on a couple um, uh, suppliers, I think. So, so you have read about this company recently. Then. I have what? Have you read about this company recently? I analyzed this company in yeah. great depth, actually. I mean, like as best as I could um, as a net net. I, I think if you want to know what a U.S. net net that you might buy, if you could find 10 of them, this is one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, now, there aren't 10 of these, but there's about, I'd say, two others that are about as good as this right now. I'm not going to say which ones they are. But um, so I think it's pretty good. It's actually paid a dividend for like um, 40 or 50 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, you know, the land and stuff is on the books at low values, but I looked up where the land is and stuff. It, it's not, um, you know, I, I'm not seeing huge hidden assets or something here. And the company ha doesn't uh, talk a lot. But if you look, let's just look at things like CFFO, you know, cash flow from operations and stuff. As you can see, the, the, you know, mostly none of that stuff is very worrying. Mm. You know, and they have paid a dividend, and yet they still have the balance sheet they have and everything. This is very typical of a Ben Graham type net net. When people ask me, you know, what when I say like he wouldn't buy the net nets that people mostly suggest, mm -hmm. this is what he would buy. Now he'd buy a hundred of them though. He mm -hmm. would not just buy this one. But this does check all the boxes of being it's paid a dividend forever. It's kind of an okay company. It's you know, there's nothing that I can detect about it that's in any way um, questionable or anything about it. it's, um, it looks a lot like many pri private steel companies probably look like this, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. My grandpa is in the steel business. Yeah. Yeah. They mm -hmm. own a, a steel um, factory and business in Great Lakes Tubing in Illinois. Okay. And they have like 80 employees. I know he, he has said like in his business, he's good if you have like an 8% net margin. Yeah. <laughs> it's very capital intensive yeah. too. And a lot of that has to go back into the business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. Thoughts on intercom communications, ETM. I don't think I do have a lot of thoughts here. This was written up on the website. 
It's yeah, we've, cheap, and we've yeah. talked a lot about it, to be fair, on the podcast. It's very cheap now. Here's the thing. Um, it was heavily in debt. So it has a combination of things that a lot of people like, but I worry about. It had very big um, ownership by the insiders, but it's not just ownership, buying by them, which I know a lot of people love and has been shown in the studies to you know result in good returns and stuff. But all, I think I like don't value that as much as some people do, I guess. And so... Um, that combined with the fact that they had a lot of leverage, um, which those same insiders put on it, so it kind of they were betting on their own merger, which is fine if it works out fine. Then then it, um, this, they come into the merger with this CBS Radio. It was like spun off and then into them. It, it, basically, they're ha- it's sort of like their spinoff, but they're kind of a smaller company that bought a bigger company. Um, it was a minnow swallowing a whale. Yeah. And it was done through, I think, was it, it may have actually been through a reverse Morris Trust or something, but it, so it, it was, it, yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, my problems with it were basically, so like radio might be declining over time and whatever, but my problems were more the extreme amount of financial leverage on top of the operational leverage, especially, unfortunately now it did happen that we have an advertising recession and I didn't know what how, kind of state it would be in, in an advertising recession. So that's the thing I would worry about. There's just tremendous leverage at the station level for the you know ad rates and things and so if ad rates drop a lot you're in a position where you know it's not that great and if we just look at the debt um if we look at the balance here something we can show you what i mean so compared to some of the other companies we've been looking at for a while so you know uh, maybe it's best if we do we just have long-term debt there yeah yeah so just ignore if it says any short-term debt and just take the long-term debt so the long-term debt says how much one point we could round up seven billion. Okay, and then if we go to, I'd um, say a three-year average is probably like one point seven five billion. Okay, something like that. let's go to the cash flow statement. Okay, and then so now there could be things having to do that with they had to make payments and stuff with the merger and everything. But what was last year's cash flow from operations? Just ignore the one hundred thirty-two million. So it's just too much for me. The the mm-hmm. ratio of the debt to the cash flow from operations is too much for me. I mean, it's, it would be a lot even if this was a business that you knew was going to be fine for the very long term. But for radio, I don't know about that. Mm-hmm. So it's just too much for me. And we can make a full disclosure just because it's not something that we focus on. doesn't mean that you can't make money. doesn't mean that doesn't fit within your portfolio. We're very concentrated investors and we stay away from leverage. So that's you know mm-hmm. why we didn't. Um, this was my favorite question. Does Jeff still rock a leather jacket like it, in his old Guru Focus headshot? I have. That's actually one of my favorite pictures. I have you. a leather jacket in my closet. You look so young. <laughs> yeah, I have no a, beard. <laughs> young. Uh, yeah, I have a leather jacket in my closet. I'm not big on the leather jacket's about the only jacket I will wear. Yeah, <laughs> it's like Tom Cruise in like Mission Impossible. You know. Uh huh. <laughs> um, what were your top three highest conviction investments ever? Um, that is a great question. I would say, uh, am I allowed to use a group? Probably not. Sure. Okay. So Japanese our podcast, we do what we want. Japanese net nets. Um, yeah, I would say, uh, okay, well I can give a bunch of them. Uh, Japanese net nets, um, bank insurance, uh, which is a Jeff laid the hammer down to the board. (laughs) Uh, bank insurance said, if you don't listen to me, I'm going to, I'm going to start a proxy fight and they listen. Uh, uh, huh. Yeah. That's how it happened. Uh, <laughs> but it, it did fine. Um, and then, uh, when I was really young, I bought, uh, Activision. And so that would be one. If it wasn't for those, the other ones would probably be, uh, things like, uh, just in terms of not in terms of necessarily that they worked out or whatever, but just things like frost and NACA, which we've talked about before. What about breeze Eastern? Even though you didn't buy it, I don't think. But no, you wrote about it. Wrote I wrote it. about it. Yeah, I wrote about it and liked it a lot. Um, but yeah, I would say those. Uh, the, the ones that stood out to me um, probably are bank insurance and uh, Japanese net nets. Uh, just because they were perfectly good companies and they were very cheap. Like when I tried to start buying bank insurance, what happened is, as Andrew sort of alluded to, is that I was basically starting to buy it. And then the insiders offered, people who own about 70% of the company, offered to buy out the rest of the company. And uh, so then it turned into like a, you know, just a, a, a arbitrage thing or whatever. But um, it was trading at a, I just thought it would earn a 10% or high return on equity in most years. It had a combined ratio that was great. And, um, you know, single digit PE, uh, pretty big bit discount to book value and stuff when I was buying 
And so same sort of thing with Japanese net nets. They were all perfectly good. I, I, everyone I picked of the Japanese net nets were all net cash companies, and none of them had a loss in the last 10 years. So in fact, I was reading The Intelligent Investor recently, and Graham gives an example of 85 companies there. And you always ask, like, so which Japanese net nets? So some worked out and some didn't or something. And he, in that his little sample, he mentions that 78 of the 85 companies had significant gains. And that was kind of my experience with the Japanese net nets. Now, it would be like a timing thing and whatever is lucky about it. But just compared to most forms of investing, that investment in bank insurance, and you can go on our website to find the letters that I did write or something to get an mm-hmm. idea of what the investment was. And um, buying a perfect good insurance company at 50% discount to book um, that has underwriting profit almost every year for 30 years or buying companies at net cash that have profits for 10 straight years and doing it on a diversified basis. Yeah, those are very high conviction ideas. Those work out. Next question is on NACO. He says, NACO coal mining produced 34 tons of coal and made 26 million. NA mining produced 45 tons and made $0. What do you think the capital cycle looks like for NA mining projects? Does it make similar profits per ton as coal? How many tons of lithium might Thacker Pass produce per year? We actually know that answer. I mean, I don't know that it'll be true, but you can go to the website that Lithium Americas has and figure out how much they have in the life of the entire mine and how much they expect to produce in each phase and stuff like that. Um, So uh, that's easy to find out. I don't think the price per ton will be meaningfully have any similarity between um, Lignite and Lithium. Um, I have a guess as to how much the price per per ton is at NACO stuff. I don't want to say it because I don't know if it's exactly true, but there's some data and stuff too. And NACO is such a big producer in Lignite that I think the data is using NACO heavily. Um, So I am more optimistic about uh, NA mining than everybody else, I think. I think it's in the startup phase and I think a lot of expenses that um, are, you're seeing a lot of expenses there. I think this, this year it already produced a bunch um, compared to what it's done in past years, and I think in the longer run, it should be pretty good. But I could be very wrong about that. I just think that based on what NACO provides and what that industry is like, so the lime industry uh, mainly. Um, thoughts on INS? It is the company providing the tech for Goldman Sachs to service the Apple card. And somebody says, sketchy board of management makes it a hard pass. Oh, okay. Um, any thoughts on the company? I don't know. The Have company. you ever looked at it? Don't know the company. Don't know anything about the board. Okay. Um, would you like to see companies have more flexible dividend policies, more special dividends, paying out a percentage of the profits instead of a fixed amount? Uh, yes. I mean, if I was running a company, that's what I would do. But, I mean, in some ways, I think that the, the ideal way a company could do things is that you'd have at the end of the year, fiscal year or whatever that you have, you say, here's how much money we think we have in excess capital. Um, who wants to be bought out? You know, who, who let's uh, do buybacks and dividends, you know, in some sort of way that works with doing both of those things, you know, mm-hmm. um, based on either a tender or probably a tender followed by a special dividend or something. Um, I don't expect that that will ever happen. Uh, but it would be nice if companies said like, um, how much excess capital we have and then why we're doing what we're doing is our stock expensive or not and, and things like that. Um, but I, I'm okay sort of with the approach that they have in the sense that it in theory at least gives you information about it. I will say that if you look at the companies that did special dividends at times, that's a pretty good list to look at companies that pay special dividends, as long as they didn't borrow the money and pay the special dividend. Um, can be pretty interesting because it usually means they made the payment either because they thought they were overcapitalized or for some tax reasons or something. You'll see it more among families and things like that. It usually indicates pretty good capital allocation or some concern about it if you see. Uh, it's just something to note. Mm-hmm. The list of companies with special dividends are something to pay attention to. Somebody says, I just want to thank you guys. I've learned a lot. Then someone says, what is the most critical lesson you've learned? And then he responds, says, to read a 10K a day. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm close. I don't understand enough to trust myself yet. It goes faster than reading a lot of books. And then he says, thank you. That's a great practice and habit. So we actually just recorded um, a video on habits. Yeah. And per usual, when I asked Jeff what he thinks would be the best habit to implement for an individual to become the best investor that they possibly can. He did again say, I know I always say it, but to read a 10 K a day. Mm-hmm. 
So awesome. Thank you so much for listening. And it's fun doing the podcast because people listen and we get feedback. And as long as we're learning and having fun doing it, I don't think we'll ever stop. Um, you said, love your discussion of Jeff's favorite business a few months back. What are some of your least favorite or some that you struggle to understand? Uh, I'd say I'm very bad with retail stuff. Um, and that's be, I mean, you understand the business. It's just, you don't feel certain about the future prospects. That's what you're saying. No, I mean, I, I don't think I understand why people in the next few years will pick one retailer instead of another and stuff. I think I fundamentally have trouble understanding the customer behavior. But you fundamentally understand how a retailer works. How it works. Yes. Yeah, maybe true. Yeah. And there's something that I don't necessarily think are bad businesses, but I don't think I have a very good understanding of. I mentioned before, I would like to have a better understanding of reinsurance. Um, I might have a better understanding of reinsurance than some investors, but I don't have a good enough understanding of reinsurance to invest in them, I feel. Um, I think, uh, yeah, so uh, mm, commodity things are kind of tougher for me. Uh, like what? Mm, globally traded commodity things, I'm, I'm perfectly, I mean, it, I always say commodity things and then people are like, well, but would you invest in Timberland? Would you invest in cement? Would you invest in lime? Would you invest in, uh, I own basically a rock pit at one point and stuff. Yeah. I would own all those things. The <laughs> economics of them are totally different. So location based advantages like that are different. But for instance, they talked about lithium, you know, we can't invest in NACO, but I can't invest in a company that, uh, actually takes lithium out of the ground because the, I have no idea what the price of lithium will be, you know, mm -hmm. years from now. So those things are all tough for me. Um, yeah. I would say those kinds of things, even manufacturing things and stuff, things that are um, uh, anything that has a fairly commodity input and a fairly commodity output is very difficult for me to analyze over a longer period of time. I mean, my only approach to those sorts of things is you can buy them in like a Ben Graham type basis, but it's very hard for me to buy them on any other sort of thing. Um, I've tried to analyze some and kind of like some of them. If you go to quick FS, you can look at one business that I kind of actually like as an organization. I've studied them up a little bit. They're actually McKinney, I think. Um, uh, Encore Wire. Do you know the ticker? Encore? Uh, E-N-C. Encore. E-N-C-O-R-E. Oh. So. Oh, I, I've seen their building before. Yeah. 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 Right off of 75. Yeah. So, um, uh, look at the return on invested capital there. So I've looked at them for a while and stuff and, and thought about them and, um, you know, read everything that the company talks about their uh, business and everything. And uh, it's always been hard for me to figure out what their returns on capital would be in the longer run and stuff like that. And, and they've been very variable. Uh, as you can see, they haven't really been all that, you know, great on the, like if we look on the 10 year median, there is like 10% or something. Mm -hmm. It's easily something that I could misjudge and think would be better than it was. So I have to be careful about businesses like that. Um, mm -hmm. I could have easily paid above book value for that and shouldn't, you know, not. So I didn't buy it or anything, but those are tough. Hmm. Uh, thoughts on using pre-tax provision earnings as an indicator of a bank's earnings power. What's a reasonable multiple for a well-run bank with high quality deposits? Uh, that's very hard to say. Uh, yes, that's a good way of doing it. I mean, you know, uh, they have to be applied to some year, but there's no reason why you should pay attention to it in that single year. So it's long term. Whenever we did things, we always used like a um, average of what we would think they would lose in a given year. So like if you think they're that normally they have losses of 1% or something, then that's what you should charge off, you know, and tend to be that we look at like what were your charge offs over the last 30 years or whatever data that you can get. Um, so the fact that they have charge off 3% in a single year or something or loss provisioning or whatever, um, it shouldn't be a concern. It might be a good time to buy a bank when it's, um, you know, having a lot of losses that way. That's how Buffett bought into Wells Fargo. Uh, I think the multiple should be high if it has good growth. I'm alone on this. So what does <laughs> high mean and what is good growth? High means high. I mean, high means if the like twenty P plus bigger than yeah. If the P on, on the stock market is fifteen or something, a, a, a bank, a small bank with high quality deposits that's already earning good returns on assets and stuff could easily be worth twenty five times. That's not where they trade at. I think the, the, one of the best things to do is find a small bank that's successful and buy it 
um, because it often is basically as the economics of a growth company, like a, you know, Phil Fisher type company, but it trades at a very uh, reasonable price. So yeah, it could definitely be worth that much. It, you know, you just have to do the math on it, but look, if something pays you a dividend of um, two or 3% a year and grows seven or 8% a year, that's 10% right there. And you can find banks like that. And th that would be at 25 times earnings or something for them. So it, it's possible. Most small banks aren't that good. And uh, most really high quality banks are so big that they may not grow that much. But if you find a high quality one that can grow a lot, it's a really good business. Same with insurers. What does Jeff think about investing in stocks of fund management companies? I don't really have a lot to say about that. A lot of people have asked me that. There's a ton of operating leverage, and I don't know if it'll shift to things of passive and stuff over time. So I, sometimes I like, um, I like fund management companies a lot. Uh, I, I like the management a lot. I like the. Um, I would be happy to say that their funds are good, but I can't predict that their actual business will do that well. Um, next question: Free cash flow fluctuates a lot from year to year. What is considered normal free cash flow? Uh, I always recommend using a three-year average. Mm -hmm. The last three years, that would be my recommendation. Average them out. Watch the video. Just type in free cash flow on our YouTube. There's so many topic or so many discussions on it. But the best video I think that we've actually done on it was free cash flow plus growth, valuing stocks in Warren Buffett way. We actually just re-recorded a more recent one, um, and then also the video that we did on cash, the cash flow statement in general. It's actually one of the most popular videos on YouTube. Um, on the Graham Munger value spectrum, with zero being a cigar butt puffing Graham and a 10 being a high quality business hunter, where do you two fit on the spectrum right now and where do you want to be in the future? That's a good question. Um, I, it's hard to say the answer, maybe a five or something right now. Uh, I would always like to be a 10, uh, but- the, I was gonna say you're a five. But the problem, thank you. <laughs> but the problem is that, um, uh, finding things to do. So if you look at the history of Berkshire, let's use that as an example, sort of the Munger thing. Um, I would say that during the period in which they had really good results, let's say from about 1965 to 1995 or so, um, I think by my calculation, they made one really good investment every three years. <laughs> the rest of the record doesn't really mean things one way or the other. So the, that's the difficulty. And I would say that I, my inclination would be to be more Graham when I have to have more ideas and to be more Munger when I can have fewer ideas. If I could have one idea every three years and people would be happy with that, uh, then we would be very Munger. Um, but if I would have to come up with a diversified portfolio today, uh, it would be very Graham. What's the best way to determine reasonable growth assumptions when modeling a DCF? Uh, I mean, you can look at what the biggest, so there's a few things you can do. One, you can look at what some of the biggest companies in the industry already are and predict whether this company can ever get to be anywhere near the same size. You can do predictions about penetration rates and things of what they would be in the industry um, versus the future. You know, someone asked me a question about a very tiny energy drink company or something. I said, well, look, if Is it, it this one? Yeah, it Celsius. is Celsius. Yeah. And Official so, sponsors of the Focus Compound Podcast. <laughs> yeah. We wish. Um, so I uh, I was like, okay, well, you know, we can do some calculations here. So one of the calculations is pretty simple is that can they actually be profitable enough to grow as fast as – so in recent years, they've grown at 50% a year. So one calculation I did is, well, is anybody in the industry that profitable? Yes, Monster is profitable enough that it could, could grow at 50% a year. Now, it can't because it doesn't have the growth prospects, but its return on capital is high enough and has been for a very long time. So, yeah, it could self-fund growth. So that's one of the first key ones. So in the industry, you can self-fund growth. That's not true in many industries. So there's no way in almost – in you know, nine out of 10 industries, even if you had the option to grow at 50% a year, even if you could borrow a lot and stuff, you can't actually grow at 50% a year. So, you know, in a beverage business or something, you can. So you can do that calculation. Then you can say things like, okay, well, could they ever get to be anywhere near the size of one of the leaders in their field? Like how big would they be versus the leader? So say the leader keeps growing at inflation or something, how big would they be versus monster or something in 20 years and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, how can you find small companies with moats if they're often competing with bigger companies that are not market leaders? Seems to be the case for small firms and competition seems to be the term factor when I say pass on many small cap opportunities. Uh, yeah, most small cap companies I look at are, are not very good. I have to go through long lists of small cap companies to find any that are interesting. I think there's plenty of small cap companies that have great moats. It's sort of a... 
I don't know if you want to call it survivorship bias or what, but if you look at like the S&P 500, what you're going to find is that it's very tempting for investors just to like large companies because everyone you look at is going to have a moat because they're all old and they had to make a lot of profits. They have to have huge amounts of retainers to get big. Small companies don't necessarily have to have a moat. So all you have to do is you have to go through many more of them to find the ones with moats. But remember, most of the big companies actually started out as small companies. Some of them turned out to have moats. The others didn't survive. And so you're left with the S&P 500 type thing. So I don't think that small companies don't have moats um or you can't find ones that have moats i don't think it's difficult to do it's just that mm, yes you'll end up throwing out most small companies pretty fast whereas with big companies it's a lot easier to find the possibility that they have a moat they don't necessarily have a moat now but they probably did at one time um it, it requires like just analyzing them in detail and usually figuring out something that other people haven't figured out about what that moat might be, but you can also screen and figure out why has this company been having high returns on capital for a while and stuff like that. This next question is on FOMO. He says, how do you fight the urge to not chase profits? If you see a stock that is blowing up, but you haven't done due diligence, how do you stop the urge to jump on it and join the ride? Or do you not get this urge? Hope that makes sense. Thanks. I don't get that urge. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> do that a couple of times, you, would, you know, yeah. I mean, like, think about it. Take the stock out of it. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't do that with a business. Right. You would apply the business, you would analyze the business, and if you're going to invest in it, you would think like an investor, not a trader. Yeah, I, I don't have that urge. Um, it's possible, I don't know if you call it the reverse or what, the Buffett's talked about how sometimes the stock moves up after he was planning on buying, and then he ends up not buying a lot or something. That's more possible with me. That could happen, where I, I don't keep buying as a stock goes up or something like that. Yeah. Three questions. How far into the future are earnings being currently discounted? Uh -huh. Uh, it appears that has been extended beyond reality. So I'll answer that part first. Uh, hard to say. I mean, I guess maybe if you're counting interest rates at being near zero forever, then not very far. But absent that, yes, they're being discounted far. He says, two, explain, if able, the total disconnect between the SP500 action and multiples. Uh, so it's difficult to explain. I, I, I don't have an answer. Um, I think credit is not tight. <laughs> I think people have, uh, I think there is plenty of money around. And I think that in many cases, um, uh, when you see declines in stock markets that are attributed to recessions, they may also just be a result of tight monetary conditions. Those, it's hard to separate those two because they usually go hand in hand. And this time they're not. There's a recession with loose um, money. And then three are the markets, you put markets in quotes, mm -hmm. that myopic to focus on only the top 10 companies. So, I mean, that's something that we've talked about a little bit lately. Yes. How much of the SP 500 is because of other companies other than, you know, five of the biggest companies that are like heavily weighted to that. It's to the an market. interesting sign. We don't talk about sentiment and stuff, and I'm not sure that I want to, but it is an interesting sign that would happen if you felt like you want to be in stocks, but you don't want to pick stocks. You know, not just pick stocks, but you want to be in stocks as a, in equities generally but you don't have strong ideas about particular things that you think are going to recover or something. There is a pretty big difference. Like if, like I say, like the market hasn't gone down that much, but actually if you look at certain groups in outside of like the S&P 500, they've actually declined a lot. Some things are down 30 or 40% still. Um, it, among smaller things in certain industries, it could be energy, it could be retail, it could be banking, whatever. But there's actually a lot in them that are uh, pretty, uh, have declined a lot, whether I like them or not as businesses. And that hasn't happened at all. I mean, the NASDAQ is like flat or up or something. Certainly the biggest tech stocks are probably not down at all this year. Do you make any adjustments to earnings? Capitalizing R&D, write-offs, write-downs, one-time or unusual expenses, pensions, tax rates, depreciation, LIFO, FIFO? If so, any shortcuts or rules of thumb? Uh, I'd say no, because those things generally don't, uh, if those things matter, do you want to change my decision of whether I buy or not? Uh, I do calculate all of those things, and uh, I it's more an issue of like, I'm worried that they're not spending enough on R and D or, uh, stuff like that. I, I do adjust out, uh, write downs and things like that. And, and there's some other ones that are just like very technical and stuff. So yes, do I, my idea of an earnings power or something for a 
bank or an insurer or whatever is different than the reported earnings. I, I often don't use the reported earnings as the decision of what I would buy or not on. Mm-hmm. I usually come up with some number that I think is the normal earnings, and it's usually based on something else. So as an example, an insurer or something, I would never use the reported earnings. I would estimate what I think their underwriting margin would be, and i estimate what I think their return on their investment portfolio would be. And use that. I would never use like a reported year's earnings. Honestly, same thing for a bank. I wouldn't care about the reported earnings. There's a lot of information out there. At what point do you stop scuttlebutting? What do you think of the 80-20 rule? 80% of the important info is gathered in the first 20% time. How do you handicap biases of people you might reach to learn about a company and industry? I think that's true. I think a very, very small part of what's useful for me uh, with scuttlebutt, I mean, I think... But Scuba is useful for me is a very, very s- small amount of information, um, but key information. And often you don't know what that key information will be until you look. Um, so it's something that comes along that way. Uh, the other thing, though, with Scuttlebutt is that it's often beneficial, like overall in the entire industry and stuff like that, to learn more and more about it. And I think that's the part that's very underrated. So uh, Buffett's investments in different companies, um, like he owned a bank, he owned an insurer, he owned a newspaper personally and stuff before he made investments. uh, I mean, Berkshire owned it. um, Before he made investments in uh, stocks in those areas is very helpful. So like knowing a lot about that industry. Phil Fisher talks about that too. Really, he did a lot of scuttlebutt and stuff, but it also helped him have good contacts in the industry and stuff. So actually a lot of it bleeds over. But I agree with that. that, uh, Definitely, you know, one-fifth of the time you spend on something gets at least four-fifths of the information on that stock. But I will say it turns out that learning a lot about this one stock, you actually realize it pays off later in people you've talked to and whatever about another stock that's somehow related years from now. Next question. You mentioned about having cash is a significant value at this time due to optionality, but where do you suggest placing cash? An example, bank in your backyard, treasuries, or cash alternatives like Berkshire. Is someone still doing this? Um, the corporation should put in treasuries. But what uh, about an individual? <laughs> Uh, you're fine up to the FDIC insured limit in any bank that you're at. And I think you're fine beyond that. Um, so in general, $250,000 for a bank and, and there are ways to have it above that basically. And I think you're probably safe in a variety of different banks anyway. And it's not something you should ever worry about. Um, what about the mattress? Is that safe? Yeah, I wouldn't put it in the mattress. (laughs) Um, but the individual, I mean, keeping cash in their I mean, would you ever use Berkshire as sort of like a placeholder? No. Got it. How much of a margin of safety do you need in cigar butt before you pick it in favor of a compounder and vice versa? Uh, Hard to say. I usually do a calculation about 10 years out, and if it seems like the cigar butt under any reasonable circumstances would outperform the compounder, then I would buy the cigar butt. Um, But a cheap compounder will usually outperform uh, the cigar butt over 10 years. It's just that an expensive or even fairly priced compounder may not. So, And you can be wrong about those calculations, but that's an easy way of doing it. I've suggested before three to 15 years, meaning that um, it just to, for comparing stocks, if you get numbers that say that stock A will outperform stock B over 15 years, it's really hard to argue that you should buy stock B because in year 16 and on it mm, will outperform. Sure. That, that's really difficult to say. So, and you know, I, I gave the example of like Movado as a net net versus Google. Movado outperformed Google for the first five to six years coming out of the financial crisis. Um, Google is a better company and it's worked out better now to today, but it is hard to say, look, you shouldn't have bought Movado mm-hmm. and then sold it at some point. You know, preferring Google. Not that I'm going to blame anyone for preferring Google or Movado. Either one works, but that gives you some indication. Thoughts on AutoNation? We own a car dealer, so I probably wouldn't buy AutoNation. Um, I like their capital allocation historically and stuff like that. Uh, and I think American car dealers are probably a bit better than UK car dealers, probably. Um, but I do worry about like leverage and things like that and cheapness and the one that we own in the UK, I I kind of like better on those two. If you find a positive net net working capital stock with a positive cash flow, would taking inventory into calculating excess cash be a double counting as inventory is part of future operating cash flow? Yes, it would be. 
Uh, and so it's very important not to do that. Uh, I kind of don't count the cash flow and stuff like that. I, I don't really count the earnings. I like them to have earnings, but you just count the net current asset value. So you just figure out that you, you think it has earnings, you think it has cash flow. But yes, I'd be very cautious about that. And in fact, that's one thing that worries me sometimes when people talk about free cash flow stuff is that if free cash is exceeding earnings for several years in a row, people will say, oh, well, it has a lot of free cash flow or something. Yeah, but it's liquidating. That's why it's doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, it's liquidating over time. But that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing and what you want to see. Uh, we've talked a little bit about stocks like that where, for instance, one stock um, – over a period of four or five years, people complained it's still a net net. But what had happened was it changed from being like 80% of net current asset value being inventory to like 80% being cash. That's what you do want to see. But you're right that in a sense, that's not like you earned it or anything from it. It's just something that turned inventory into cash. That, But, you know, most people want to, would rather own a lot of cash than a lot of inventory. This guy asked for a snap judgment on MLHR. Familiar with the company? Let's see. Herman Miller. Inc. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I know what they do. It's interesting that we got two questions about this. So they make furniture. Uh huh. PE. One of the nicest chairs ever sat in, I think they made. Oh, really? EB <laughs> yeah, free cash flow 12 times. How did you know that that was from them? Oh, because in hotels and stuff, when they put in really expensive chairs, they put in a thing that tells you all about the chair and stuff so that you'll, you know, buy it. That's so funny. Yeah. Um, most people probably would just overlook that, like me. <laughs> I have a bad back, so. <laughs> That's true. You're like, I need this for home. Um, uh, 2010 revenue, $1.3 billion has gone uh, to $2.5 billion. 2019, that's a 10-year CAGR of about 5%. EV to sales is 0.6. Uh, currently, EBIT margins eight point three, so kind of in the wheelhouse. EBIT to free cash flow twelve times. Yeah. Um, so, it. Let's see. Um, I think I'm a little concerned. If I'm reading this right, I'm a little concerned about the price not being super cheap. Just because this is an industry I have a lot of familiarity with or a lot of comfort with. See, the EV to sales is 0.6 right now. Mm-hmm. And so that's not bad with the EBIT margin that they've had historically. And the EBIT margin doesn't seem terribly... Gross margins are incredibly um, predictable. Yeah. Um, but we also do have some uh, leverage. Uh, you know, not a lot, but we have some leverage. Um, I do you know, like we said, the gram number and stuff is good. I mean, it's one and a half times book, but it's only uh, six to seven times PE. So um, it looks interesting. I would be careful about the industry, but from the numbers, it looks interesting. Got it. Uh, what's your view on event-based investing? Uh, I do not have a strong view on that. It's not something that we do, but it's the kind of thing that probably... Um, would work well for professionals. Last question of the day. How did you and Jeff meet? Oh. Why don't you take that? No, why don't you take that? Uh, I always tell a story. I don't hear what you say. Okay. Uh, Andrew reached out to me. I think probably he reached out to me because he saw uh, Quan, so when I worked with Twitter, said that he was in Plano. Yeah. And you were, your office was in Plano at the time or you were living near there? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Living in McKinney, office in Plano. All right. And uh, you uh, sent me an email saying Plano, question mark, question mark, question mark. And uh, just asking if I was really in Plano and um, then if we could meet up and stuff like that. That's what we did. We yeah, went we to did. Cafe Express. There's no Shops at Legacy. Here, yeah. Cafe Express is not there anymore. Yeah. And now it's a T-Mobile that they've been building forever. And the T-Mobile is like, I don't know. That's a big piece of real estate. I don't know why they need that big of a... Isn't that place huge? It's so weird. So this Shops at Legacy place, it's very nice. You see a lot of things kind of cycle in and cycle Mm -hmm. out. And especially they built this Legacy West on the other side, which is another some billion odd development, which is very nice. It's a master plan community. And the competition's kind of fierce because now you're seeing on this side of the train tracks... Mm -hmm. Um, you know, retail and stuff, everything just kind of cycles in and cycles out. And that T-Mobile was kind of a head scratcher for me. Why are they putting it there? Well, they needed something. They've got a lot of vacancies over here. Yeah. When they put in the new, um, the new uh, Legacy West development, they took some of the more expensive ones over there. Mm-hmm. They kind of have a few things that had... There's a Tesla retail over there. Yeah. And they have a few that had, um, like, uh, we have the Del Frisco's uh, grill 
and they have the real uh, steakhouse, and we have the Marriott, and they have the Renaissance, you know, things like yeah. that. So a lot, it's it's a lot of the same companies, but they're higher end thing over there. Um, yeah, and so that place is gone now, the uh, Cafe Express. But then we started going to Starbucks, and they've got plenty of those. Yep, Jeff every day would get a salmon salad with a Shiner beer, Texas's beer. And yeah. a piece of cake, whether it was carrot cake or chocolate cake. <laughs> yes, and coffee, yeah. And coffee, mm-hmm. and coffee. Because I worked over, I would work out of that restaurant. That's why I would use it. Yeah. It was very convenient. So, like, you would come for our meeting thing, and basically, sometimes I'd have already been there and stuff, working and mm-hmm. whatever. Just because, like you said, it's a huge location. So, I like working out of places like that. Yeah, and that's how, that's how we met. So, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with Jeff and myself today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> on this podcast uh, if you want to ask a question in the future go to my twitter at focus compound hit that follow button on mondays i usually do a call for questions and then you could ask a question we'll have it be on the podcast if you're listening to us on youtube hit that subscribe button thumbs this video up a rating review goes a very long way for us on the podcast side of things if you like quick fs uh, which was the website that we were using mm-hmm. you could either click the link in the show notes or you could just tell them in a survey that you heard about them from us and we'll get a piece of that. We are affiliates of quickfs.net. We love the product and we use it every single day. I'll thank everybody so much for tuning in. We will see you in the next podcast. Take care.